here uh, a very clear activist approach. The Israeli courts have always been very active in terms of um, uh, the review of judicial and uh, uh, judicial view of executive actions, including administrative detention, including the borders of the uh, wall of security or the barrier of security the, the, for, for the Israeli uh, and for the Israeli court, uh, it is a matter of routine to deal with such uh, questions, including target killing, unlawful um, um, investigative methods, and the limits to, for investigations. The two other examples I want to mention is the case of the German Constitutional Court ruling in 2006 that the statute authorizing the shooting down of a hijacked plane is unconstitutional. The reason being that the right to life under the Constitution, it's called Basic Law of Grundgesetz of Germany, cannot be subjected to any qualification. The argument was that the government cannot turn the passengers and the crew on the hijacked plane into objects and the government cannot make any balancing between the right to life of the people on the plane and the right to life that have to be protected of the people that are going to be uh, um, <coughs> killed if the plane is used as a missile. So uh, this does not solve the issue what happens uh, without an act. Could the Minister of Defense order the destruction of the hijacked plane and then still claim the ground of defense of justification or, ne or necessity. So the fact that you don't have a prior authorization does not mean that you don't have a post facto defense which will be based on necessity. And in fact, the Minister of Defense, after the judgment of the Constitutional Court, said, okay, that you decided so, but I will do exactly what I will have to do in case there is a hijacked plane. Similar decision was given by the uh, uh, Polish Constitutional Tribunal, 2008, more or less making the same reasoning of the Constitutional uh, German Court. So here, to summarize, we see a very clear approach of the judiciary to subject the, uh, both legislative measures and executive measures of emergency to judicial review and um, we, we have to expect the courts to strike a balance. On the other hand, we have to expect the courts that the balance would be uh, reasonable and not lean either direction, not to support invasive uh, policies, however, to protect the public from a very vicious and very damaging international terror organizations that pose a threat to the democracy, don't respect life, use children as human bombs, and therefore the, cha the, the, the challenge of the judiciary is great, but having such great judges in India and other places, we have full confidence that they will give the right answer. Thank you. What I was going to say in those circumstances, and along the theme that Professor Shatrit has been speaking on, the issue that I've come to speak about is whether the balance as between terrorism and human rights has been struck in the United Kingdom. The first piece of major terrorist legislation <coughs> to be passed was the Terrorism Act 2000, Section 1, which defined terrorism as any political, religious, racial or ideological cause designed to influence the government of any country or international organization, or to intimidate any member of the public anywhere in the world. This clearly encompasses much more than the 9-11 or 7-7 situations. And there can be no doubt that the British courts have had great difficulty in grappling between the appalling consequences of terrorist activity and striking the balance in favor of much cherished principles of human rights. And in this context, on the 13th of July of this year, the brand new Home Secretary 
the Right Honourable Theresa May promised a review of counter-terrorism legislation in the face of a clear divide um, inherent within the government um, being a coalition government and much dispute amongst them as to the justification for this review. And very quickly, let me tell you what the four areas of intended review are. Firstly, stop and search powers. Under Section 44 of the Terrorism Act, legislation at the moment allows for the search of any person for articles of a kind which could be used in connection with terrorism. The only, there is no requirement of reasonable suspicion. The only requirement upon a police officer is if he or she is of the view that it's expedient for the prevention of terrorism acts. The impact on human rights in this respect means that essentially within the whole area of Greater London, a person can be stopped and searched at the whim of a police officer. The evidence shows that ethnic minorities have been um, overriding victims with 17.7 of the people stopped and searched under the provision being Asian as against 4.0% of the population. Recent authorities um, have clamped down on these provisions and I'm using the shorthand for time purposes of course um, and held that section 44 amounts to a real curb on the um, uh, uh, rights of the individual and um, that um, as a result the government have undertaken to review the stop and search power as a matter of urgency. Secondly, 28, pre 28 day pre-charge detention is currently permissible in the United Kingdom. This is a period which grossly outweighs the period of justified and legal pre-charge detention in any other jurisdiction in the world, as I uh, understand it, uh, and certainly in the free world. The evidence suggests that at least half of those detained for up to the 28-day period since 2006 have been released without charge whatsoever. And again, there is a divide within the coalition government as to whether this period should be reduced to the normal period of 48 hours or down to 14 days. At the moment, the power remains in force but is up for review. Control orders have been particularly controversial. These permit for control orders to be imposed upon individuals suspected of terrorist activities, which allow for electronically monitored curfews of up to 16 hours a day, reporting requirements, bans on visitors, bans on certain communications and internet use, um, no passport, no travel documents, no driving license, no MOT certificate, no camera, no mobile, no USB stick, memory card, anything of the kind. In circumstances where the individuals concerned have not been charged with any offence whatsoever, nor where there is any prospect of prosecution imminent, but simply where the Home Secretary takes the view that there is reasonable suspicion on the basis of evidence which cannot properly be disclosed that the individual is suspected of terrorist activity. The courts have recently ruled in a number of cases that control orders are contrary to the human rights provisions and at the very least that evidence justifying them must be disclosed. And this provision, once again, has caused major dissent within government power but it's the third of four um, terrorist um, provisions said to be up for review. Finally, deportation with assurances, which allows for the practice of returning individuals who are deemed to present a risk to national security to their home countries, in circumstances where, where as the evidence suggests, is still happening, um, torture and fundamental breach of human rights is at risk. Um, notwithstanding that the government stepped up its efforts recently to seek diplomatic assurances or memorandums of understanding with countries in question of human rights records, nevertheless provision allowing for the return of individuals um, to states suspected of human rights violation um, still, still exists 
and again the courts have recently ruled that this, this practice is in breach of human rights legislation and that the argument often taken that to return to country A with a view to country A then sending the subject on to country B um, is not a sufficient or justified circumvention of the power and this allegedly barbaric power is one that is the fourth of seven provisions up for review and all I have time to focus upon. And so finally and in conclusion, hopefully having met my seven minute deadline, obviously once again the question arises, has the balance been struck in favour um, of, uh, has it come down um, fairly in favour of the one side or the other, has it been struck at all? clearest possible evidence is that the domestic courts in the United Kingdom, bolstered by decisions of the European Court, take the view that this is not the case, and appreciating the difficulties that arise, of course, and that is an understatement, nevertheless, that substantial aspects of UK legislation are contrary to human rights provisions. At the moment, the much-promised review, which is now um, becoming something of an ageing process, has not begun whether it ever materialises or not, we shall have to wait and see. Thank you very much. With the permission of Honourable Dr. Justice Kiri Balakrishnan, mm -hmm. Chairman, National Commission of India, and former Chief Justice of India, yeah. my respects to Professor Simon Sharet, Mr. John F. Fernandez, and uh, Mr. Jaren Dean, the barrister from UK, and the esteemed legal professionals present here. A very good afternoon to all of you. Today it has been a very historic day for our country with having a meet of the lawyers, the team members of the jury from all over the globe. When the topic human rights and terrorism, as discussed by the eminent deputy <coughs> sitting on the dais, and of course the respected senior members of the legal fraternity sitting in the hall. Human rights, as we all understand today, is a topic and a universal en entitlement necessitating its fullest implementation. The Declaration of Human Rights in the original declaration as well as in the constitution of the, and the laws of the countries is a very big necessity today. As human rights awareness and countries is a very sensitive, has grown into leaps and bounds in today's time. However, the problems of implementation and translating them into practice exist, in fact, around the world in different manners. Violation of human rights are steadily on the increase on an unprecedented scale. Even in democratic countries like today in India, all have mentioned we are witnessing the ongoing scenes of the terror attacks. So today, the, basically to start over with, with my topic, human rights coexists with the human dignity and the sovereignty of the human entity. All our efforts naturally have to bring to place today within the law, within the jury, within the court, that how to curtail this upcoming terrorism within the globe. Maybe it's our country, or maybe it's a neighboring country, or it's around anywhere. The sole purpose, as today we know, that the National Human Rights Commission Act has been formed. It's a placement, like in Section 3 of the Act, lays down the central government to constitute a body of the National Human Rights Commission, which is governed by a former Chief Justice of the country. But these commissions today, as we have all noticed that if somebody becomes a witness, either he's a professional or he's a layman on the street, the commission needs to review certain amendments so that a common man who is affected, because an affected person <coughs> knows what has happened. I would like to contradict the thing that the media has exposed us a lot of initials as uh, barrister colleague from UK mentioned that that also needs to curtail over the aspects. Like today, the basic furnish of the such information within the review of section 176 and 177 of the Indian Penal Code are the dire need 